Hi, I'm Robert Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Welcome to the podcast. If you'd like to listen to the show on your phone, you can subscribe by searching for 80,000 Hours wherever you get podcasts. We're on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else you might be looking. That way, you can listen to the episodes spared up, which makes us sound a whole lot smarter. If you'd like to support the show, drop us a review on iTunes or post the episode on social media. That helps more people find out about us. As always, the episode description links to a blog post with a guide to the episode and further resources if you'd like to learn more about the topic. There's also an option to apply for coaching for those people who want to do quantitative trading and donate a large fraction of their income to effective charities. And now I bring you Alexander Gordon-Brown. Today, I'm speaking with Alexander Gordon-Brown. Alex studied pure math at Cambridge and for the last three and a half years has worked as a quantitative trader in London at a firm called Jane Street. This has allowed him to donate hundreds of thousands of pounds to effective charities. Alex is also an active member of the effective altruism community in London. We're planning to talk about what quantitative trading is actually like, whether it's an effective option for doing good, including whether potentially it could cause harm, how to tell whether you're a good fit for it, and if so, how to go about getting a job in the industry. Thanks for coming on the show, Alex. Uh, thanks, Rob. Happy to be here. So what actually is quant trading? What, what do you do? So very broadly speaking, quantitative trading is making trades in various securities on the basis of some quantitative research that you've done or a link that you've discovered or a link that exists and trying to make money off things being mispriced in the market. So in Jane Street's case, it operates as a market maker and a liquidity provider with a specialization in ETFs. And I expect we'll come back to what exactly those terms mean later. So the main reason people would go into quantitative trading or, or quant trading is that it offers uh, very impressive earnings. And obviously, I, I understand you wouldn't want to divulge your income or your peers' incomes at Jane Street. Uh, and so I'm not going to ask you for any information about Jane Street uh, specifically. But I did want to share some of 80,000 Hours' own research on compensation potential in the field of uh, quantitative trading. Uh, and our own research indicates that if you go into quant trading, initially you'd be earning six figures or so, uh, both in pounds or dollars. And then after five to 10 years, your income is uh, likely to, to plateau. And how much you'll be earning at that point depends on, on how well you're performing relative to other people. And you could end up earning in the low hundreds of thousands of dollars, potentially. But the top, say, 20% of people within the firm will be earning at least seven figures and potentially tens of millions of dollars if they're uh, particularly good staff members. Uh, and I personally know people who, through working in, in quant trading, were able to donate hundreds of thousands of dollars a year within the first two years of being out of university. And then within five years, we're, we're able to, do, to donate seven figures basically every year. Um, and I guess you get to see how successful the, the, the very best people in your industry are for, for yourself, Alex? So you might think so, but it's actually pretty hard to work this stuff out. I think it's something that will probably come up later that a lot of the culture is laid back enough and people aren't really showing off their wealth. So, so they're not wearing gaudy jewelry to the office and things like that. Exactly. So you can guess, but you don't really know. They're they're not covered in bling, and that's 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 not the yeah, sort of exactly. thing that people respect in in contracting. Right. Exactly. So, so is it fair to say that it's a fairly subdued or kind of uh, even secretive industry? Um, it, it can be, uh, but I think internal to the firms, the atmosphere is generally really pleasant and open. Okay, right. Uh, and people talk to each other as if they're on, on a level, even if some of them are 10 times uh, richer, richer than others? You do. Like People talk to each other as if they're peers and... I think if you had people sort of showing off how much they're earning in a very obvious way or how much flashy stuff they have, um, it would sort of cut into that, and so it tends not to happen. Right. Um, and so you work at a, at a partnership, right? So, so, so the managers at the company, you, you're, the, the people managing you are trading all their own money. That's right. 
D- does that make them them really cautious? I guess like any losses you make are coming straight out of their own pockets. So are they very antsy? So it, yes and no. Like it makes them cautious uh, in a way that I think is good, which is that they really care about uh, tail risks that could lose the firm serious amounts of money um, or possibly even bankrupt the firm, of course. Like, whereas for, say, uh, a manager trading with clients' money, that would just mean that they lost their job and now they need to go and find new clients and so on. Like, for these yeah. guys, like, this is, this is their life's work and in, probably in many cases their life savings. Mm. Um, so if I do something awful that costs the firm like a really serious amount of money, then that's on them. Um, it's not really on me. I'm, I'm just a staff member at the end of the day. There, there, there was one uh, quantitative trading firm that managed to like make itself bankrupt in half an hour by yep. uh, you know programming their algorithms incorrectly, and it started doing all of these crazy trades, and it, and it interfered with the market, and people people could see that something very strange was going on. That's but right. I guess it, it took them half an hour to shut it up. Uh, Night, Night Capital, is that right? Um, I, uh, I'm not in a great position to be uh, bad mouthing competitors, but right, yes, this, right, did, okay. this did this did happen, and uh, it's pretty easy to find if you look for it. Yeah, sure, okay, but th- but th- that's the kind of thing that uh, your your managers would be terrified of, right? So, that, that's, so they're putting that's, that's in all absolutely. of these safeguards to try to make sure that this that that never happens, that they suddenly lose all of their money in half an hour of of madness. That's absolutely right. Like with these firms, like there are sort of like two very distinct ways that you can lose all your money. You can do trades that are actually bad um, yeah. and lose all your money that way. Uh, deliberately do trades that are actually bad, I should say. Um, or there's this sort of uh, you know, electronic automation risk where a bunch of computers do things that no human would ever have sanctioned if the human was able to follow and understand what was going on. Um, and those are both pretty significant risks for a firm like this. And as you say, the management has every reason to worry about both of them. So, uh, do you have a lot of colleagues who are who are very charitable, like like you are? It's not that easy to tell. Um, I think a lot of people, more people than you might expect, uh, do have a significant interest in charity in some form. There are a few other people who I know where I work who are involved in effective altruism and the sort of surrounding area in some capacity. So those people clearly have some interest in that. But even beyond the, that relatively small group, I think there's like a wider set of people at the firm who are involved in charity in some way, don't necessarily talk about it that much. But it varies tremendously from person to person. Yeah. Have you have you managed to, to convince any people to, to start donating? Maybe any of, the, any of the people who manage the firm and, and have a whole lot of money? Uh, I wouldn't say I personally have done that. There have definitely been cases where I think I've been able to have good, uh, just open conversations with people about why I'm doing what I'm doing. I definitely like the fact that I'm able to be open about what I'm doing and not have that be uh, sort of judged or something like that. Like, that's very helpful to me that I can just be honest about, like, my thinking and my motivations. Um, Whether I've convinced anyone to follow me, uh, I wouldn't go that far. (laughs) Sure. So, so you said earlier that, that because you're working at a, at a private partnership, you don't have to kind of convince anyone else to go along with your ideas. If, if, if uh, the people within the firm think it's a good idea, then, then you can just do it. D- does that change the, change the culture a lot? Because it's not so much about sales. It's, it's just about like, convincing yourself about what's right. Uh, I think that's right. I think it changes it in a couple of ways. One we've just talked about already, like with the risk thing. The other thing is that it really uh, it puts so much emphasis on the value of of recruitment and the value of hiring. And then once you've started, the importance of really understanding why you think what you think and why you believe what you believe uh, so that you really are cognizant of places that you could be going wrong. You can flag those up to the relevant people if you're proposing something. Um, And just generally, like, it, it puts a increased level of responsibility uh, on the managers, yes, but also like by sort of filtering down on like the individual staff members to an extent to know what they're doing, or if they don't know what they're doing, then to know that they don't know what they're doing. Do you keep track of how much money like each individual trader has made? Is that possible? 
You could try. It would be quite difficult. It probably wouldn't help the firm's culture very much. And right. um, in my case, like I couldn't, I couldn't give you a number for me for any period in my time at the firm. Um, and I'd be even less able to give you a number for anyone else. Um, I don't think this is a number that's being tracked particularly carefully because there's a real issue that as soon as you're tracking that number carefully, as soon as people know you're tracking that number carefully, it distorts incentives uh, for people away from the firm's incentives in fairly damaging ways. Huh. How, how does that work? So if you're tracking people's individual um, like individual trading profit, uh, then now if I have a really good idea and I have a, like a trade that I sort of came up with and have been executing for a while, I don't want to teach that to anyone else. This trade's making money. That money is like my money at the moment. And even if there's something better I could be doing or something I could move on to, and even if there's a new trader who's just started, who would actually be a really good fit for this trade, I don't want to teach that person because this trade is making money. The only point at which I want to teach it to them is the point at which it's not making money anymore um, or it's making a lot less. So mm. if you actually like want people to be able to share information and to treat all of their discoveries, if you like, as the firm's discoveries, then I think some some level of being willing to not look too much at how much individual people are making is necessary. Now, how far you can take that varies. I think where I work has taken it to sort of the extreme case where it's just extremely difficult to get those numbers, even if you wanted to work, look at them. Yeah, interesting. I thought you were going to say something about how it makes people too risk-taking, that if, if, it, if you're tracking people's performance, then maybe people want to you know, uh, double or nothing in order to try to get promoted. That's definitely Cause, cause an issue. Yeah, yeah, um, and so I guess it, yeah, tracking people's individual income, you you wouldn't be able to, or, or individual earnings, you wouldn't be able to to actually do it do it accurately. So you would end up with kind of a a perverse measure of the value add that they're providing, and and one that they could game. That's right. Yeah, I think it's extremely difficult to come up with uh, concrete non gameable measures of performance like bear in mind you've hired these people because they're good at thinking analytically and to an extent because they're good at working out how to optimize things and like understanding complicated systems and breaking them down this is like not the set of people that you want to give a challenge of hey here's this metric that we're going to decide what to pay you with go and work out how to game it <laughs> like that is a tremendous zero sum waste of effort from the perspective of the firm. Turning now to what it's actually like being a trader, um, I, I guess you wake up at seven a.m. on Monday or six a.m. on Monday. What, what what's your what does your day look like? Uh, in London, the markets open from eight a.m. to four thirty p.m. And in some sense, those are my quote unquote core hours. Those are the times when. I really want to be in the office at pretty much all costs. And that will be true for most people who are in a trading role. And then outside that, there's some flexibility. So for me personally, currently, maybe I'm working something like 7.20 to 5.30. So sort of a bit of time around both the start and the end of the day. Um, but there's variability on that. The main, the fixed thing, which no one can change, is like what the market hours are, which are the 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Yeah. So, so you get in at 7.20 in the morning. What, what, what's the first thing you're, you're doing? So the first thing I'm doing or the first thing that I'll be doing for like at least the first 40 minutes is trying to make sure that we're ready for 8 a.m. So that might be looking at things which have happened overnight uh, I have a generic policy of I, I try really hard to not think about work stuff too much outside of work. So I'll come in at 7.20 and it will be like, oh, there was some important news halfway around the world yet today. Um, and I'll be catching up on that. Um, there'll also just be some amount of systems work to sort of just have our trading systems ready to go at 8 a.m. Any issues that have come up, anything which has changed, anything like that. Um, and... Yeah, just making sure that we're not going to turn on at the start of the day and either miss a bunch of good trades or do a bunch of bad trades. Both are possible. 
Interesting. So, so you've got like algorithms set up, like trading processes set up, and and I guess when you get in the morning, you want to make sure that they're not about to start malfunctioning because this because the world has changed. Uh, I think that's right, and it would it wouldn't even describe it as malfunctioning. It's more like they're doing what you've told them to do. Right. It's just that what you've told them to do might not make a lot of sense on the particular day in question. Okay, so th- so then so then markets open at eight a.m. Uh, and and the the firm's computers start start trading like crazy. Um, w- what are you doing then? Are you, are you watching each of these trades and, and, and are you looking for things that are happening that are strange in the market where you can make money? So yeah, this will have like I want to say that this will have like a fair amount of variability from person to person. So I'm happy to talk about the things that I will be doing and. I'll try and caveat where appropriate with things that other people might be doing. Um, so yeah, for me personally, like a lot of it is uh, checking on the trading that we're actually doing. Also, um, some amount of our trading is still done manually, and that's therefore a thing that I need to be like more obviously thinking about, even over and above the automated trading. Um, gradually, things will normally settle down. Often, there's like a flurry of uh, busy period after the open, and then things gradually settle into a state where you understand what's going on, um, and then you have more time to think about longer term things, to do any sort of programming or automation work that needs to be done to deal with any problems that came up before the open that you looked at and decided. Ah, I can't really deal with this before the open, but I should come back to it at some point. So when you're watching trades, what is what is that like? You're, you're like seeing each line as it comes in? It can be that. Um, it can also just be sort of doing a cluster of related trades. Um, mm. So there's some variability there. And I guess it, a lot of it is just sort of like, you know, will have come in to the open with probably some idea of the kinds of trades we might do. Like, we'll have some idea of the kinds of decisions we've made, we'll have some idea of the kind of adjustments we've made. So it's hopefully rare for us to do a trade and be like, hmm, I have no idea why that happened. If that (laughs) happens, then probably we missed something. Um, But even the trades which are sort of the trades that you expect to do, often there's just a lot of information that comes through in the trades about that helps inform you about whether you're doing something which is actually sensible. Right. Okay. So, so the market settled down a bit. At that point, are, are, are you looking for like for prices that are out of whack where you can make money? And, and and how would you do that? Once markets have settled down a bit, I think there's a couple of things. Like one is that markets never quite actually settle. By which I mean. An hour after I get in, uh, a lot of the Asian stock markets close, or in particular, the Chinese stock market closes. Later on in the day, the US stock market opens. A little before that, a few other countries' stock markets open. Just sort of depending which time zone you're focusing in, there is normally something happening somewhere in the world. Um, And a lot of those various countries opens and closes you don't care about, but some of them you do. So you do get this sort of continuous incoming set of things that need to be dealt with that you want to try and prioritize appropriately. Um, uh, As for like things being sort of straight out of whack, like in an ideal world, that's what you're trying to get your automated systems to do. Um, Sometimes the world is less than ideal, so that doesn't happen. And certainly keeping an eye for those cases and then normally thinking about how you could automate it better next time definitely does come up. Um, how, like how much human judgment is, is involved here? Because So most of the trades are being placed by algorithms. That's, that's why it's yeah, quantitative trading. Um, but I assume humans, like have to, humans have to program the algorithms. So, so how, how would you go about searching for, for problems in, in the markets that, where you can make money? This is an area where uh, I should definitely flag that I don't have all the answers. And I think in some sense, the fact that different firms answer this question in different ways is part of what makes them different firms. Mm. Um, But uh, some things are sort of like, you can look for cases 
where uh, new information of some kind turns up and needs to be absorbed into the market, or I should say, like, needs to be absorbed into all of the markets, like the various country stock markets which are open, um, the various other types of markets which are open, and so on and so forth. And it's relatively common for information to appear, and then it takes a while for it to be fully assimilated, I guess is the right way of framing it. Um, and I think there's probably a whole category of trades that boil down to X happens and X hasn't been assimilated fully because different parts of the world have reacted to X in different ways. Is it fair to say that the way you're working, you, you, you're often looking at the relationships between the prices of multiple different assets and then seeing when they, they've started to deviate from what's sensible? I think that's right. Like a lot of the time, you know, you have a good idea of what pairs or sometimes more than pairs of things like should have strong relations to each other. Like you can often you, when you say that two things have a strong relationship, you're really making two statements. One is that there's a good a priori reason to think that these two things are related. And secondly, you probably hopefully back tested it and observed that these two things are related. Um, and once you've, you've gotten confident about that, looking for cases where they don't seem to be acting as either you've historically seen them act or as you'd expect them to act from a sort of a priori view of the world uh, definitely does come up. Do you make money on, on, on all of your trades or is it more like you make money on 51% of them and, and that's enough to, to do well in the long run? It's, it's closer to 51% than all of them. I'm not sure it's quite that stark, but yeah, it is certainly a case of you you do a bunch of trades and some fraction of them will work out badly. Some some fraction of them will work out badly in ways you sort of understand, like you sell something and then there's a huge general stock market rally and now the thing that you sold is worth more just because most world stock markets are worth more. Um, and sometimes things will fail in more complicated and harder to post-mortem ways. But yeah, a big part of the job is you will make mistakes and you will lose money. And that's sort of, that is just part of the course in some ways. Where do, you're a mathematician. Like, where do, where do your math skills come in here? I am a mathematician. I, I did maths at Cambridge. I don't think I've really used that much of the knowledge, I suppose I would say, that I gained at Cambridge. But I think what I have used extensively is the sort of mindset and the aptitudes, which to an extent I had before university, but university certainly helped train them. Um, so it's a lot of like uh, general problem solving and puzzle solving abilities. To an extent, you can think about the financial markets as a very large, very complicated, mostly optimized puzzle where a lot of people are thinking quite hard about how to make all of these things sort of be in line and make sense with each other. But because it's such a complicated problem, there's still definitely scope for more intelligent people to come and look at particular aspects of it and find things which don't make sense. Um, and I think it's more that sort of chasing down problems and really analytically going through puzzles, that sort of mindset that is often associated with maths, but is certainly not uniquely a maths thing uh, that I'm really using. Does the firm hire non-mathematicians? Uh, definitely. So like, for what to state the most obvious, I think computer science is probably where I work almost as highly represented as maths, maybe more highly represented, certainly more highly represented if you include the developers. Um, and even among the traders, uh, I think it's pretty close. Um, and then even beyond that, like when I'm thinking about recruiting or if I'm looking at a CV or something like that, I if I see physics, then I'm not going to mentally knock that person down any relative to maths or computer science. Like what I really care about is 
some evidence of general problem solving or puzzle solving or analytical thinking type ability. And that ability is actually spread over a reasonably wide variety of subjects, though it's certainly clustered in the so-called STEM subjects. You're a trader, right? That's right. Um, what, yeah, what, what kind of different trading roles are there and what, and what non-trading roles are there? Uh, partly I can answer that with sort of some reference to the different aspects of the day that I spoke about because there's some scope to specialize into these things. So there's the sort of keeping the trading systems in good order uh, is important. Like someone needs to do that. Someone needs to make sure that when things change, then your systems get updated correctly or that they just stay in good states. Like most systems left to their own devices for years without maintenance will just drift into a bad state. Um, So that's one aspect of it. There's also the thing I talked about of monitoring the trades that you're doing. And very closely related to that is evaluating after the fact the trades you're doing. So when you're doing a trade, there's this sort of process of coming up with the idea for the trade in the first place, testing it, getting enough people on board with it that you can actually do it, doing the trade, and then going back afterwards and checking if things worked out as you expected. And sometimes that sequence could, in theory, be handled by one person. Often it makes sense to break up different aspects depending on people's preferences and specialities. Um, This is something that will vary tremendously from firm to firm, but if you think through it of that sort of life cycle of a trade, if you like, then hopefully it gives a better idea of the kinds of things where where people are needed, where like human resources needed. Mm. What, what do you mean by life cycle of a trade? As in, sorry, as in that sort of like uh, coming up with a trade, proposing it, implementing it, and evaluating it. Like, mm. And at each stage, it's it's kind of being passed between different people. Uh, it can be, like, or it can like it depends. To a pretty large extent, I think that the answer to that will depend on the firm and will depend on the trade as well. The more important something is, the more people you want watching it. Uh, The more risky something is, the more senior people you want keeping an eye on it so that they really understand it. The more just sort of technically challenging something is, the more it means that the particular person who came up with the idea might not actually have the knowledge or skills to make it happen. So... There's a decent amount of variability here. Um, it's pretty common for there to be one or two people who have some sort of oversight responsibility for making sure that the trade actually happens and is dealt with appropriately. And that's something I would expect to be more true across other firms. But beyond that, it's hard to say specifics because it will just vary quite a bit. So speaking of, of equipment maintenance, um, a lot of people will have heard about high frequency trading. It was in you know this popular nonfiction book, Flash Boys, and people uh, were really worried about it a few years ago. Is that the kind of thing that you're doing? Do you have to stick your firm right next to the market so you can you know get there within the right millisecond? I think there are two angles you can take on speed in financial markets. Um, and... One is there are some kinds of trades which you can do where you could only do them if you're the absolute fastest. If you have the sort of fastest computer systems and the fastest connection and the best location and so on and so forth, because there are a bunch of other people trying to do exactly the same thing and the person who does that trade or the person who's fastest. Um, There's a second issue with speed which is being fast enough that you don't do too many bad trades against the first group that I just Mm. described. So there's sort of being fast enough to actually make trades, and then there's being fast enough to defend yourself. Um, And I guess I worry a lot more about the latter than the former. Uh, I don't, I personally don't normally feel like I am racing to do a trade though under particular market conditions, our systems might well be racing to cancel trades. Uh, interesting. So so you have to make sure that uh, the really fast people don't take advantage of you uh, because you couldn't cancel a trade you know, quite quickly enough. Uh, yeah, that's certainly something you want to avoid to the that, th- greatest extent possible. That's called sniping, right? Uh, I haven't come across that term. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I saw that, and some people are concerned that uh, the really fast traders are actually discouraging uh, groups groups like you from from working in the market because they because they chip away at the money that you're making by uh, like taking advantage of you like re- really quickly before you can withdraw trades that are obviously now mistaken. Um, but I, I don't I don't think the effect is that large. Yeah, I, that's my gut immediate reaction to what you said as well like i I understand the argument that you're making in theory and i can envisage a market where that theoretically could be a big problem but it, it doesn't feel like a big problem to me sitting here right now so do you enjoy the work uh yeah very much and um i did actually want to say i think in respect to something you said earlier about the main reason to go down this path is due to the exceptionally high earnings. I think that's probably true from us with my sort of uh, effective altruist hat on. But with my personal hat on, I was already quite likely to do this job before I heard about effective altruism and before I had much interest in the high earnings because I do actually enjoy what I'm doing and I enjoy the culture of the firm a lot. What's what's to like about it? So um, a couple of things. Like, Firstly, I mentioned that it's drawing on my sort of problem solving, puzzle solving abilities. Speaking personally, using those abilities to solve problems is something I actually do for leisure quite a lot of the time. I play chess, I play Magic the Gathering. Uh, I personally don't play poker, but a lot of people who are in this kind of work enjoy playing poker. And there are aspects to trading which have commonalities with each of those games. And really what it's drawing on is like, I find it fun to work through difficult problems. A lot of other people don't find that fun, and that's fine. But I've always found it fun to work through difficult problems. It's something I've routinely done in my spare time. It's part of why I studied maths in the first place. And to the extent that firms like Jane Street hire mathematicians, I think that's a lot of what is being selected on is people who just like solving problems for fun. Because you do this job. Right, so... You're working along... Sorry, go on. No, 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 you go... I was going to say, like, you do this job, you're working relatively long hours, like not long hours by the standards of finance, it must be said, but long hours by the standards of the general population. Uh, It can be relatively stressful work. Losing is frustrating and you will make mistakes and lose if you do this job. If you don't enjoy the work when it's going well, if you don't enjoy the cases that you do get right, then I think you will be not long lived for this sort of work because it will just burn you out really quickly. If I was considering going into this job, I don't, I don't, I don't think that I quite have the intellectual chops for it. But, but if I was, um, how, how would I be able to tell if I enjoy it? I suppose, do I enjoy playing chess and, and you know, card games and things like that? Is, is there anything else? So I think those, yeah, those kinds of games can be a good litmus test for just sort of whether you like solving puzzles. I do know some people who don't really like playing those games because it just all feels kind of trivial and boring and inconsequential, but they like trading because it feels real and there are actually stakes attached. Some of those people like playing poker, for instance, and don't like playing other forms of competitive games. That makes Um, sense. So there's definitely that group, but broadly speaking, I think that's a good kind of attitude to think about. Uh, The other one I would mention is a real willingness to communicate and work in teams. A lot of the, if I think back to my friends from university, and even if I think back to myself to an extent at that age, though I think I've changed since, a lot of people with those kinds of attitudes do tend to have a sort of like reserved, uh, somewhat introverted type about them where they are most happy when they get to go into a room on their own and just work on a problem quietly for hours at a time. And that's actually a really important skill to have if you, say, go into research or if you go into academia. But if you go into trading, then while that ability to just calmly work through something is important, it's equally important, if not more so, that you can actually communicate your ideas to other people afterwards and that you can sort of have an active conversation and be actively updating with the thoughts and ideas of the people around you. Speaking of the culture, a lot of people think of all of finance as having this kind of very macho culture, like something out of uh, American Psycho, yeah. Wolf of Wall Street. But yeah. your work is absolutely <laughs> nothing like that, right? Uh, that's that's right. I totally sympathize with the people who say, 
I would never, ever want to work in finance because I could <laughs> never imagine myself fitting into that kind of culture. I also could not imagine myself fitting into that kind of culture. Um, some people fit into it fine and good for them, but it's not for me. Um, so in terms of culture, I guess the type to draw on is we've talked already about, you know, the firm is hiring a bunch of mathematicians, computer scientists, physicists, other STEM type subjects from uh, top universities in most cases. So it's that type. It's that culture. People, if you are at university doing that kind of subject and you like your group of friends at university, you'll probably like the people that you meet working in quant trading because it's the same group of people. They're just a few years older um, and often not that much older in many cases. Yeah. So, so it involves a lot of teamwork, basically. Uh, that's right. Yeah. I think the team aspect of this is pretty distinctive relative to a lot of the other options that very highly quantitative types often have available. And, and you want people who are, who are pretty humble and able to admit their mistakes, that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. So I think this is a hard thing for, peop- for one to assess like of yourself. But if I'm thinking about the kinds of things that I would be happy to see in people that a new person who joins my team or whatever, that real raw willingness to learn and to make mistakes and to admit to mistakes quickly and to look for mistakes that you might be making. Like often if someone, if I'm mentoring someone new, for instance, I might not have the time to really check up on them and pick up on exactly every mistake they make. Um, Obviously I'll try to catch the most important ones, but if it's really just so much easier if the person you're mentoring or teaching or training or whatever it is, is keeping an eye out for their own mistakes and they just come to you and are like, ah, yeah, so this morning I made this decision and that was a bad idea because of X, Y, Z. Like, that's Mm. much more optimal from my point of view. And then we can have a chat about why that mistake happened and how they could maybe avoid it in future. But it takes a huge load off me if they're going to do that themselves rather than me having to watch over their shoulders. So someone who's brushing mistakes under the carpet, that's, that's going to be extremely problematic, right? Because they might do the same thing again and, and, and they're losing real money each time. That's absolutely right. And I'll also say that if you go back through the history of trading firms or traders which have lost their firms exceptionally large amounts of money, so much of it starts with someone made a mistake and they didn't want to own up to it. That's 90% of the time. I guess, to pluck a number out of thin air. It feels like that's essentially what happened. Someone made a mistake, they didn't feel able to own up the mistake, and they doubled down or they covered it up in some way, and right. it became a bigger and a bigger and a bigger problem until eventually they couldn't cover it up anymore. So they uh, swallow the fly and then swallow the frog. and <laughs> Yeah, exactly that. And then eventually you're, you're down a billion dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've, I've met... Uh, quite a lot of people in, in trading and, and some people in quant trading. And, and it does seem like people are, are, are more reasonable and more, maybe more rational than, than people in most other industries. And, and, and I've always put it down to the fact that uh, like each time you lose, you've lost real money and it's measurable. And uh, you're, if your prediction was wrong, then you're getting, you're getting whipped for that. Uh, and so there isn't a lot of reward for seeming overconfident. Like there might be in other, in other industries like sales or marketing. You, you just kind of have to be honest with yourself because otherwise you're going to end up bankrupt. Does that seem right? That sounds right to me. I should say that it will partly be a selection effect as well. Like when from a recruiting side, when you're bringing people in, that's an ability you're looking for. So, you know, even people who've just started at the firm, I would hope are scoring more highly on that kind of rationality. That is to say the ability to not be too overconfident and to understand what you don't know. I'd hope those people score better than say your typical person from a top university, because that's part of what we're trying to select for. Um, But it's certainly true that once you start, that feedback loop absolutely goes into overdrive even more. And I guess I feel like I'm much less overconfident than I was when I started. And I still have a way to go to get to something which is actually rational. Do do you do any active training to try to calibrate people well? So when they think something is 70% likely that it actually is 70% likely to be true? I can't think of anything super formalized. But informally, there's a lot of just 
getting people to actually state the kind of thing that you just stated. Because I think in a lot of places, what would happen is people would say, oh, I think this is likely to happen. Um, or I think this is almost certain to happen when by almost certain they actually mean like 65%. Or maybe they mean 95%. Nobody knows because you don't put a number on it. And I guess the culture is more to like try and get people to quantify the assumptions they're making. And especially when people disagree uh, about a set of assumptions, I think there's a much greater effort than there would be in most places to really like dig down through the numbers of various possible outcomes and understand in that way where the disagreement is coming from. So it does force you to be more comfortable with saying things like, I am 35% sure that this is going to happen. Are you, are you always trying to, to trying to quantify things like that? If someone said, you know, it's very likely, is that regarded just as sloppy? I wouldn't say it's sloppy, and sometimes it doesn't really matter. Sometimes, sometimes everyone is on the same page, and sometimes all you really care about is that this given probability is greater than 50%. At which point, if everyone agrees it's very likely, then you're not serving that much purpose in arguing further about it or trying to be more precise about it. Uh, with that said, if someone says something's very likely and I only think it's, say, 60% likely, then it probably is worth me saying, well, actually, I'd put about 60% on this. And then they can either say, that's what I meant by very likely, or they can give me a different number and then we can have a conversation about why we have different numbers. Is, is it a very secretive industry? I imagine you kind of got to keep your strategies under wraps. You can't just go tell me exactly how you're making money here because otherwise people might, people might copy you. It's secretive in that way, yes. It's secretive in that uh, the firm has intellectual property and it doesn't want to lose that intellectual property via its employees telling, especially employees of other firms, but implicitly therefore also saying in public, too much about how the firm makes money. And there's not really any getting around that. Um, I will say that within the firm, like within the sort of four walls, the atmosphere is very sort of open and sharing focused. So it's kind of easy to forget about this a lot of the time. But Yes, of necessity, the firms are secretive to outsiders about exactly what they're doing. Yeah. So do you get to socialize with people at other firms on, on Friday nights? Do you go out to the pub and, and talk about what it's like being a, being a trader? Um, I guess I don't. I don't think it would be impossible to. And I do know people who work at other firms. And when I chat to them, I just try not to chat about work in too much detail. Yeah. And I can sort of detect that they're doing the same thing with me. Um and I will say that, you know, like anyone can go to a pub and complain about how their manager blamed them for something that wasn't their fault or <laughs> how someone their training was a complete moron today or whatever. Like you can have a lot of the usual rants about work without really going into details about what exactly you're doing. Yeah, it's not it's not the CIA. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving on to, to the impact of the work, uh, a concern that some people have about quantitative trading that, that I have a bit of sympathy with is that you might be doing harm through the work itself or, or, that, it, or that it just might not be that socially productive. So maybe, maybe you're increasing inequality in the world or, or increasing the chance of another financial crisis. So uh, setting aside your donations, do you, do you think the, the work that you're doing is useful for the world or not? Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I pretty strongly disagree with this. Um, I think, and, I, and I'm happy to engage with this concern more to the extent you can put uh, more specifics on it, because I think a lot of the time, like people make a bunch of uh, different, not entirely focused or not entirely coherent claims. And sometimes when you put them all together, they don't make a lot of sense. Um, but to answer the question more directly, like I, I do think about the, the actual decisions I'm making and the likely effect of those decisions on the world. And most of what I do, I can pretty readily frame in terms of providing a service to the markets and providing that service at a mi marginally cheaper rate than other firms are willing to. Um, at which point, if I wasn't doing that, then firstly, much the same things would happen. It's just that people would pay more for the service. And Secondly, like to an extent, whenever you're providing a service like that, it's sort of to an extent it's worth what other people are willing to pay for it, I guess is the first point I would make. Um, 
So I struggle to draw a link, I guess, from the actual things I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis and some vague distant harm like, say, increasing inequality, which is one that you mentioned. Mm. Well, I think it's very hard for people to maybe understand what, what is the service that, that you're actually providing? Like who, who, who are the direct beneficiaries? You, know, you go to the doctor, you get, like, you get a prescription for a drug that you need. What, what's the service that you're providing that, that's useful to people and, like, and useful to the world as a whole? Uh, right. So that's, that's a very fair question. And so and I think one of the reasons this confusion comes up is because the firms, as mentioned, are of necessity secretive about their strategies. But uh, to give an example, which is a pretty common example and certainly a relevant example for me, uh, a lot of um, what uh, my firm does goes under a sort of set of actions which go under the headline of market making. And market making roughly speaking, is saying that you're willing to buy a particular security um, at some price and you're willing to sell it at a slightly higher price. So if, we're, if I'm trading $50 bills with you, then I'm probably happy to buy $50 bills for a bit less than $50, and I'm probably happy to sell them to you for a bit more than $50. And I can keep doing that for a while. Um, the reason this is useful in stock markets is because when people own shares in a company and they want to come and sell them, probably at the exact instant that they are coming to sell those shares, there will not also be a buyer coming through to buy those shares. And a lot of the service that market makers are providing is being willing to buy those set shares just a little bit less than what they think they're worth and trusting to the fact that a bit later on, a buyer will come along and they'll be able to sell those shares again. It's a little bit like how you know a supermarket buys uh, you know apples uh, far away from a city and then moves them to the city and then sells them for for more. You're kind of being like a retailer, but rather than moving goods across space, you're you're taking the same asset and selling it minutes later. So you're moving it across time. Uh, yeah, that's definitely one good way of thinking about it. Um, and there are other kinds of movements that can happen as well in financial markets, like other ways in which various things can be linked. But moving them through time is probably one of the most common, one of the most relevant. And I think when you frame it that way, as I say, I find it hard to really see some of the harms that other people tend to rather vaguely describe. So market making, uh, so I've been doing a bit of research on this, so I might have some like pretty specific questions. So, sure. so market making is one of the strategies where it's, it's pretty hard to find uh, anyone who could be, could be being harmed by this. Um, and, and it's very easy to find a lot of people who, who really benefit from it. Like most other people in the market are really happy to have market makers around because it makes it so much easier for them to just always get a reasonable price for, for what they're trying to, to, to buy or sell because they don't have to wait around for, like, for someone else to come and just, you know, sell them, sell them the, the full amount of whatever they, they want to buy. That's right. Or, or the reverse. So, so mo most people are really happy about having market makers. But, but even there, there, are, there, there is a way that uh, the market makers um, could do harm and that some people have uh, criticized market makers for their effect. And that would be if you imagine that I'm uh, a researcher who's looking into a particular company and I, re and, and I believe now that it's underpriced because I did some research that no one else has done. And then I want, in order to profit from this, I have to go into the market and and, and buy up some shares in this company. Okay. Uh, and and the argument is that uh, I I've done all this costly research myself, and I want to provide information to the market, and I want to get rewarded for that. So sure. I go into the market and I start buying up this company. And the and the idea is that market makers are so good at picking up on the signals of a of a of someone who is bidding up the price because they have information that you're kind of going to drink their milkshake a bit. So you're going to take away some of the profits that they've earned or that they, that they should earn for for this uh, costly research that they've done because you're going to see oh I, this person is is buying a whole bunch of of this company and so we anticipate that the price is going to go up and you make the price go up sooner. Which, which normally would be good. Normally, you want prices to adjust as, as quickly as possible. But here, you're like taking some of the reward that, that this uh, researcher might otherwise have earned. Have you heard this critique? Um, I, I have heard variants of this critique. And I, I think my first, my immediate reaction is the thing that you said right at the end of ultimately, you probably do want the price to at least end up wherever the fair price is. 
which, if this person has just done a ton of research, might well be the price that they think it should be at. Um, I guess the other thing that I would say is I'm trying to think about how this trade would work if there weren't market makers. So it strikes me that if you don't have market makers and you want to go and do this trade, it feels like now you have an even greater problem of finding people who are willing to trade with you. Um, if you you can go and you know you have a particular company that you've decided is undervalued, you can go and look for sellers in that company. But to the extent that sellers in that company are plentiful and abundant, the market makers should be willing to sell to you as well and buy from those sellers themselves. And they will make some margin off the difference, but the industry is so competitive and spreads are so tight that I wouldn't have thought it would be a huge end effect on the ability of that person to make money. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's my first thought. That like, this doesn't. I can definitely see why this can criticism can come up and can frustrate people. But if I'm like really thinking about the counterfactual, then. I sort of struggle to make it work. I'm not sure how this works any better in the world without market makers or with, let's say, with fewer market makers, perhaps. What, what about what about other other trading strategies um, like like pair uh, pair trading? How, how is that useful? Uh, sorry, can you just clarify what you mean by that? Oh, so where you look at a relationship between you know the price of Pepsi and Pepsi and Coke, and then uh, when it deviates, then you then you try to correct it. So I think one way this is useful is just like under the sort of normal guise of market making. So take your example of Pepsi and Coke. Like normally if you're a market maker in Pepsi and you sell shares of Pepsi, then you're waiting for a seller of Pepsi to come along. And so you can buy your shares back. But if you've actually like done your research and you've decided that Pepsi and Coke are kind of the same thing, they're not. But, you know, let's say that they were, um, mm. then a seller of Coke would be just as good as a seller of Pepsi. And so now when there's a buyer of Pepsi and a seller of Coke, market makers can sort of allow those two people to actually talk to each other via trading with both of them um, in a way that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Like, otherwise, those two people are just trading theoretically unrelated shares and they'll just push the prices way out of whack um, mm -hmm. until someone works out that this doesn't make any sense and sort of pushes them back into line again. And the benefit for society is that you want these shares to uh, the, the 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 price to reflect like actual fundamental value because because this is important for society i think there's a lot of benefit to society to having a functioning stock market um the the most obvious form of that value comes from people who actually build businesses or uh people who invest in businesses at very early stages um, often their big payoff is the point at which they get to sell shares to ordinary investors at reasonable prices. Um, so I think that's like a lot of value in just having a so, functioning stock market full stop is like the ability of people to actually realize the wealth they've built. Right. So, so, the, so the reason to have the share market for these quite mature companies is so that people will start companies and invest in them in the first place. Um, right. And I think like for the mature companies, oh, I mean, first off, I personally have a pension uh, with my employer. Um, that pension's going to be invested in a bunch of mostly relatively mature companies um, via buying shares in them in the stock market. Um, that's not really an investment that I'm thinking about very much on a day to day basis. Um, but it's certainly useful to me if when I go and buy those shares, I don't get ripped off. And the best way for me to not get ripped off, as far as I'm concerned, is if there are a bunch of people competing to sell me those shares and vice versa when I come to sell them a bit later. So there's this liquidity issue, right, where you want to always be able to buy or sell something at a reasonable price and, and in quite large amounts. That, that that's it's, it's helpful for other investors, and so that's good in as much as they're doing useful work, and we, we want to make it easy for them. But it's also, I guess, useful for, for ordinary people who are just saving for their pension because they want to you know, buy a, a wide range of stocks and then like, sell them a bit to, to maintain, to, you know, to have, a, have, have a wide portfolio. That's right. And uh, you know, when, you're, when you're doing that, uh, you don't know anything, right? When you're saving for your pension, 
like when I'm saving for my pension, the shares I buy, comp the companies that I effectively buy shares in, I have no knowledge whatsoever about those companies. I have no uh, background sense whatsoever of what they're actually worth. The only reason I'm willing to trust this investment of what will, over the course of my life, hopefully become tens or even hundreds of thousands of pounds um, to these companies that I have no idea what they're worth is because I trust that the market roughly knows what they're worth. And I trust that when I buy these shares, I'm not getting totally ripped off because if I was buying shares at a rip-off price, well, then why hasn't someone sold those shares already? Someone who knows more than me. So this is an issue of... Um when when the market produces a price because lots of people have been doing research and buying and selling it, then that's that's useful for other people because they can think that that's probably a reasonable price or at least no one else knows knows any better. And and so you can gain information from that. In, in this case, the knowledge that, that if you buy this company at this price, probably you're going to do fine. Or at least if you buy a lot of companies at the going rate, then uh, you probably will make like a reasonable rate of return. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. And I think... But they're not totally fraudulent. Exactly. Like... You know, you buy 500 companies, like maybe obviously there's always some risk. There's, there's always some risk to investing in stocks and maybe one of them will turn out to be fraudulent. Mm. But you'd hope right. that it wasn't the case that the market had so drastically mispriced these things that they were, you know, predictably all going to turn out to be fraudulent in the most extreme case or something like mm. that. Otherwise, people go back to just hiding money under their mattress. What do you say to people who uh, believe, you know, yes, liquidity is important. People have to be able to, you know, to buy and sell, you know, the companies that they've invested in. But the market already provides a lot of liquidity. If you want to, to buy and sell, you know, companies in the S&P 500, you've got a lot of potential buyers. You, you can sell a large volume at a reasonable price at almost any time. So do we really need like more people working in finance providing this liquidity? And, and, and the margins, so, you know, the, the difference between the, the, the bid price or the, the buying price and the selling price is often very small, you know, less than 0.1%. So how, much, how important actually is liquidity on the margin? I think there's definitely like some fairness to that. I guess the first thought that comes to mind is, as we kind of implied earlier, a lot of the most obvious cases where uh, having a functioning stock market seems valuable isn't really for the companies in the S&P 500. It's like for companies that are relatively less mature. Um, and often the liquidity there isn't quite as extreme as it is for these very mature companies. Um, but focusing on the very mature companies for a second, I guess what I would say is that to the extent that providing liquidity ceases to be a useful service to provide because all the spreads are so tight anyway and so much size is being bid and offered anyway, and maybe if it's even the case that buyers and sellers are coming into these things so fast that they're actually able to meet each other and the traditional role of market making namely moving things through time, isn't quite as useful as it used to be. Um, that can be true, but if that's true, then what should happen is the market makers shouldn't be making any money. And I sort of question why any market maker um, would trade in a market that had actually reached that theoretical extreme liquidity situation, um, because it seems like it's not really a fight you're going to win. I've heard this argument that while liquidity maybe isn't so important, yeah, for these for these very uh, you know uh, thickly traded companies, um, you could do a lot of good perhaps by going into I don't know the, an obscure stock market like the, the the stock market in Mongolia where there's where there's very low liquidity and providing you know liquidity making services like like market making there, and that this would then make people like actual you know people who start companies or people who are trying to allocate their investments, more willing to invest in Mongolia and help the economy develop because they, they'll be confident that they can pull out their money in future if, if they need to. Uh, yeah, that, I think everything you just said makes a lot of sense to me. And I guess um, I can't go into specifics here, but talking in very general terms, if, you're, if your business is making markets, then the most valuable place to be making markets is where there aren't, in general, is where there aren't already people making markets. So, you know, you don't want to be the place where there's tons of competition and extreme liquidity and very tight spreads because you won't make any money there. That's so kind of what that list of conditions describes. Right. So you want to be going to a market where there's no one already providing this list liquidity service or, or, or prices could be, could be really wrong or out of whack because there aren't many people paying attention to it and, and, go, and go and get heavily involved in the market there. Uh, yeah, certainly in theory, that's where you're going to make more money. And I think it's also 
when you think about that situation, the service being provided, its value is more obvious. Hmm. And uh, is it so? And it's fair to say that you you look into you know developing countries or yeah countries that have less well developed markets on a regular basis. Uh, yeah, I think in general that's a fair statement. I think it's it's definitely industry wide a fair statement mm. that people spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, markets which aren't as liquid or aren't as mature, uh, which doesn't necessarily need to be abroad. Like if you know, once you go out of the S and P five hundred and look at smaller companies in the U.S., you can find similar dynamics. And the state of the world we're in at the moment, with extremely high available liquidity available for particular things, is relatively new. It wasn't always like this. Um, and I guess my expectation and indeed my hope over time will be that more parts of more country stock markets will look like that. Uh, earlier, you, you, you mentioned the distinction between uh, cases where you're, you're trading because you think uh, the prices are wrong and you want to correct them and you don't think other people have noticed uh, or, or aren't about to notice, and cases where uh, you're just trying to be like, uh, uh, you know, 10 milliseconds faster than someone else who's realized uh, this this problem at almost exactly the same moment. But presumably, you, you'd agree with the critics that in those cases where you're just racing to get the same outcome, it's not that socially productive? I think I probably agree with the hypothetical precisely as you stated it. Mm. And I wonder how often the hypothetical is actually that clear cut in the real world. Um, the real world has a habit of taking things that look fairly simple and managing to make them fairly complicated. Um, but yes, in, in principle, I think there's like some amount of fairness to the sort of this is a zero sum game argument in that very specific case. Um, though up to some point, it's worth stating explicitly that speed is useful, like speed is part of what helps me have confidence that the prices that I am trading at as an uninformed investor are actually fair prices. You don't want things to take ages to adjust to very readily understood news. But on the margin, sure. Well, th this is a huge topic that we could potentially talk about uh, for two hours. And uh, we we've been doing some research into it. And, and hopefully, we'll, we'll be able to publish something about that soon. And, and if it's up before, uh, before we publish this interview, then I'll, then I'll stick a link up to, uh, to, uh, to my view and, uh, or the view of 80,000 hours. And, and may maybe you can comment if you, if you disagree. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm happy to. But as I say, I think like, <laughs> this particular hypothetical, I think, is like one of the few criticisms that makes sense to me. But I think... yeah. At least for me personally, it feels overblown. Maybe it isn't overblown. Maybe there's like other people out there who really are sort of just doing that and fine. But for me personally, it doesn't mm. feel particularly relevant to my day job. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that criticism has been leveled in particular at high frequency trading. But, but even among quant trading, it's a relatively small fraction of the industry. And it, and it also seems to be shrinking due to, due to really sharp competition um, or oh, there's not a lot of money being made in that anymore because I think there just isn't that much money to be made by 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 these races where you're trying to get in, you know, ten milliseconds ahead. There's just not a, not a volume on that kind of time scale. Yeah, it feels to me this is with uh, my more of a lay person's hat on because I say it just doesn't feel that relevant to my day to day job. But unless you can somehow get some unassailable competitive advantage there, like some real USP, if you like, that other people can't replicate. Mm. Like most of the time when these firms make money, they're making money off their intellectual property. They're making money off understanding things that other people don't understand quite as well yet. So when you're giving me a case like this, where in the hypothetical, everyone understands it, I'm, I'm not sure how you make money in the medium term doing that. seems like Cause it, your, compet your competitors might have something to say about that. Right, right. Okay, well, we're well, moving on into how people can actually get into quantitative trading. It seems like like getting in is is pretty hard and, and requires pretty pretty high level math skills. How could someone tell if they were well well suited to working in the industry? Uh, just to I guess reiterate a couple of things that came up earlier that I think are still mm. pretty relevant to this. Uh, there's a, there is this sort of uh, puzzle solving or game playing or analytical thinking goes by a bunch of names, but there is this element to the job where a lot of what you're doing is taking 
problems and trying to understand what's going on with the eventual goal, hopefully, of making money out of them. Um, and I, apart from that, uh, and then the other thing that came up earlier is the willingness to work and communicate well as a team because really like no matter how smart you are no matter how capable you are of working things out for yourself if you aren't able to absorb the best insights of the people around you then very quickly you'll be overtaken by people who are um there's a ton to learn i guess you know i've been in this job for three and a half years now and i still feel like i'm learning a huge amount on a daily basis if you're not willing or not able to do that and to take that on from the people around you then it really will hurt you in the medium term if you did well in a in a, in a maths degree or a cs degree or, or something like that um how how well did you have to do relative to, to your peers are we talking about you know the top one percent of graduates or the top 10 percent or the top 0.1 percent who have a reasonable shot at getting in that's a difficult question um so why do I feel like that's a difficult question? I guess my immediate reaction is that that's a difficult question because this is definitely a thing to select on, but it's not the only thing to select on. So I'm reluctant to say something like, you know, I'm reluctant to define a, a specific cutoff because realistically yeah. there will be people above the cutoff who are very bad fits and there'll be people below the cutoff who are very good fits. Um, but if I take a step back and think about it harder, um, I think I can say things like, if I look at who actually is working at these places and who gets into these places, um, it is people in the main, it is people who are doing STEM type subjects at top universities. That's sort of the group. And then within that group, um, there will be some bias towards people who not just were at a top university, but sort of did extremely well at that university. But that bias doesn't feel as strong to me. I think you will find people who were sort of middle of their group at a top university, if you like. Hard to say what percentile that is on the overall spectrum of graduates. Um, and just do fine. Like, no one really cares about how well you did at university once you start. <laughs> You went to. You were fortunate enough to go to Cambridge. Um, That's right. What's the range of, of universities that, that are considered? I, I know some other areas of finance have a reputation for only hiring from a handful of universities. But if you, if you can prove your your ability, do, do, are you are you okay if you went to a second tier university? Uh, yeah, I I definitely think that's right. And I guess the thing that I would say to people listening, the thing that I say to people in general when they ask me this question in various contexts is just kind of strongly encouraging people to just apply to some of these places and see what happens. A lot of these places have like pretty no-nonsense brief application processes. So the cost to your time, if they say no, is extremely limited. The only way that this recruitment process will cost you time is if you actually get interviewed, and especially if you get interviewed multiple times. But at the point at which you're getting interviewed multiple times, you know, it's not like you're a complete washout based on your CV because no one's going to really be looking at your CV after they've interviewed you a few times. What kinds of past achievements other than, you know, uh, do, doing doing okay or, you know, graduating from a, from a good university are, are a good sign that you can get in? Um, again, I guess what I'm doing is I'm just sort of thinking through people I've worked with, thinking through people who I know who've entered this path or who haven't entered this path. And... Right. Um, and just sort of trying to look for commonalities beyond that. And the things which stand out to me most saliently probably are the the thing I've made the point I've made already about like the willingness to work with and learn from other people. Um, and also the willingness and ability to spot and fix and think hard about your own mistakes. Um, one of the traps that it's really easy to fall into if you're extremely capable, and especially if you're more capable than most of the people you've met in your life, is thinking that your thought process is sort of invincible, that you can't go wrong because no one around you is ever smart enough to pick up on cases where you can go wrong. Um, and you can see that trope sometimes in sort of popular depictions of mathematicians. Um, of this, of this sort of genius who just can't imagine ever making a mistake or can't imagine ever really screwing something up. Sherlock, um, perhaps. 
Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory, but yeah. Sherlock probably also works. Um, that type can have a problem. Um, that type can have a problem if they don't learn quickly that they are extremely invincible. Um, so uh, what fraction of people who apply actually get a job? There's a sort of... So the reason that question is tricky to answer is because a fair chunk of the filtering happens at the CV stage. And anyone who's ever worked in recruitment for everywhere will understand what I mean when I say that most of the CVs are just junk. Um, I, unfortunately, if you hire for positions in a fairly open way, like on the internet, then you get a lot of people applying who have <laughs> no actual interest in working for you, have no idea what your firm does, has no idea what the job is, um, and are just sort of spamming applications. Um, and unfortunately, those people really skew the application rates. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, what about among people who get but, to, but right. you know, a, a people, who get, people who get past the CV filter. Um, I think people who get past the CV filter, um, one way of thinking about it is, you know, this will vary widely by firm, but... Um, where I work, we'll do two to four rounds or between, between three and five rounds normally of interviews. Um, and at each of those stages, I guess I feel like the rate is somewhere between 25 and 65%. Um, so that's not a very exact number, but it gives you sort of a ballpark idea. Like it's not going to be at any stage only one in 10 or fewer candidates is getting through. Um, and obviously the firms try to avoid having stages where passing is basically a formality because then it's a waste of their time. Uh, you mentioned that the application process was pretty straightforward and no nonsense. What, what, what is it like? Or what's the, what's the, what are the stages? Often um, you can pretty much get away with uh, sort of submitting a CV. Sometimes you'll have to attach a blurb to that CV. Sometimes you won't. Where I work, you don't. Um, and if people read your CV and decide that it's reasonable, then you'll get a call back. And then it's sort of phone interviews. And the interviews tend for quant trading to be quite technical and very light on uh, what I would call competency questions. Um, so these are the sort of people who've like done enough interviewing will know what I mean by competency questions, but the sort of give a time when you have to demonstrate leadership type questions. Um, Whereas for a lot of the quant trading firms, what they really care about is how well can you solve problems? And they assess this by giving you problems and seeing whether you can solve them, how well you solve them. If you make a mistake, do you catch it? And so on and so forth. It's like when I'm interviewing someone, what I really want to have a good sense of by the end of the interview is, is this someone I would enjoy working with? Is this someone who, if they started on my desk tomorrow, I would be happy with? because I think that they are both a smart person and a teachable person. What could you do at university to increase your, your chances of getting in? So one random upside that I haven't mentioned so far that I definitely should give mention to is just like general programming skills. I think um, learning programming in some capacity um, will probably both increase uh, your desirability for the job um, and will also give you an idea of whether you like the work, which might actually be more important in some ways. Like a lot of the types of problems and mini challenges that come up in programming are sufficiently similar to the kinds of things that come up in trading that it, it does work as an indicator. Um, with that said, I want to caveat that pretty strongly by saying that when I started my internship uh, with the firm that I currently work at, I had zero programming experience and that basically just meant I had a steeper learning curve in those first few weeks than everyone else who did have programming experience. But after that first few weeks, I can't really point to an obvious point where that held me back. So if someone's interested in, in working in a quant trading fund, what, what, what can they do next? Uh, how, how can they apply? What should they be Googling? I want, well, sorry, two, two things that comes to that. Firstly, if you are actually in the fortunate category of someone who is at a top university doing STEM subjects, then one of the things that you can and probably should do is like look to your careers fairs in the US, look to your on-campus recruiting. Like Those people will have a much better idea than anything I can say 
of which firms are recruiting from that university, the kinds of things that they're looking for, whether you would be a good fit for that based on your major or your subject, et cetera, et cetera. So like use the resources locally around you because often those resources are pretty well tuned in to what's going on. Um, with that said, if you do go the online route, then I do unfortunately have to caution that there is just a lot of fairly random bad information out there. And personally, I don't have a particularly good algorithm for avoiding it. Um, you can obviously do things like you can go to a site like Wall Street Oasis, sort of a finance forum, and look for which quantitative trading firms are mentioned. And I guess if you use that to get a list of the firms, and that's all you get from it, and you don't read any of the commentary from the people who know nothing, <laughs> then that actually might work. Um, but I just have to caveat that approach with saying that there is an incredible amount of misinformation out there. Hmm. Are there kind of standardized tests that, that you give to people as part of the application process that people can, can take ahead of time? Nothing super standardized. And I think if anything ever mm. got to the point where it was too standardized, then yeah. we'd probably change anymore. it. Yeah, kind of. Like, it's, it's a bit of a waste of time if you're trying to understand how people understand new problems to give them old problems. Um, and there is a bit of a constant arms race between, you know, firms trying to come up with new problems or variants on old problems and candidates trying to work out what they're going to be asked. Um, and, you know, I was a candidate not that long ago, so I totally sympathize with the position of the candidates in this. Um, but with my current hat, I guess I have to, like, plea for people to not keep furthering this arms race. Um, yep. The firms are going to try really hard to ask you things you haven't heard before. They'll probably succeed eventually, even if you do manage to work out the things that you get asked in the first round, you probably won't in the second, third, and so on. Um, because as you progress through the rounds, you'll both be asked more in-depth questions, which don't have simple answers that you can just learn. And secondly, fewer people have done those questions, so the information is less likely to be Googleable. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I wasn't yeah. thinking only how do people get an edge, but also like can can they test whether they're actually good at answering these questions? And if they're not, maybe they maybe they don't need to apply. Uh, Gotcha. Yeah, sorry, I see what you mean. I, I think yeah. um, from that point of view, um, there's some like groups, like questions that would normally like go by the title of sort of brain teaser or things like that um, can be good indicators. They, they certainly like can be pretty representative of the kinds of things that you're going to be asked. Um, if you're, I would say that if you're doing a STEM subject, then enough of your degree is about doing these types of questions, that this is not something I would worry about too much. I think this kind of thinking becomes much more relevant if you're not doing a STEM subject, if you're applying from, uh, say, philosophy or something like that, where maybe you've like trained very well in analytical thinking, but you haven't thought about probability for ages. And then I think it definitely can be useful to like go and brush up on your basic probability that you probably did way back when you were 16 or 18 or whatever, because the questions may assume that knowledge. Um, yeah. And obviously, if I'm interviewing someone and I ask them a question, it quickly becomes apparent that they just don't have the knowledge to answer this question. I'll try and take that into account. Um, but it, with that said, it is just easier when they do have that knowledge. So that brushing up on sort of basic probability, basic stats, nothing high level, but the kinds of things that people often study between the age of about 15 and 18, um, definitely can be useful, especially if you haven't touched that stuff for ages because you aren't doing a mathematical subject as your degree. Yeah, I, I've heard that um, it's useful to be, a, if you're the kind of person who can you know, calculate what are the odds of getting between a two and a four and then a six and then a, a one or a two on, on three different dice rolls, if you're the kind of person who can just intuitively answer that, then that's a pretty good sign or who can, who can give the probability of different kinds of card draws uh, just off the top of their head or, or you know, figure it out on the spot. Is that right? Um, I think there's there's something to that. I think that kind of ability will definitely help you, especially at the early stages of the third interviews. I don't know how strongly I feel like it correlates with the actual end thing you care about, which is getting a job offer and doing well at the job. Um, mm. I think, I, and I guess I say that because I think a lot of that ability is like somewhat trainable, um, and especially it's uh, locally trainable often, by which I mean... Um, 
very few people have an excellent memory for everything, but what, what a lot of people have is they have particular things where they have a good memory for it because they just learnt those odds because they practice so much. So if you talk to people who play poker a lot, they'll know the odds of different hands just off the top of their head. Yeah. Not because they're uniquely good or uniquely gifted at memorizing the odds the of hands, but it's just, you know, this information comes up so much and you care about it, so you learn it. Um, and because that ability is quite trainable, it's not a very sensible thing for these firms to select on. Like, things which are trainable, you train. And mm. things which aren't trainable are the things that you want to be selecting on, ideally. Thinking about uh, alternative options for a minute, uh, most people with math skills are, you know, in demand in other potentially lucrative or, or really high impact areas. So, you know, they needed to, to solve all kinds of problems in academia or, or in business or, or, or in government, you know, allocating uh, grants well, that kind of thing. And, and, and AI safety research is another example that I just discussed uh, with Dario Amade at OpenAI in a, in a recent episode. So if, if you're in this camp, how do you know that working in quant finance is, is the right high impact option out of all of the options that you have? Um, so I guess I would say a couple of things, uh, just reflecting on my own personal experience, especially. Um, one thing that immediately comes to mind for me is that while I might have the raw math skills for all the areas that you mentioned, I don't think I necessarily have the other sort of uh, types of skills or personality requirements, almost I would describe them as, for each of those areas. So if I contrast trading to research, I think the ability in research to like really go into the tank on your own and focus on a difficult problem, preferably without other people interrupting you for a long period, is extremely valuable, extremely important. It's like, I think it's a large part of what, like, what will make a good researcher is someone who is like willing and able to do that. And personally, that's not something I've ever been very good at. I kind of like having distractions every now and again, and I'm aware that they eat into my productivity, but I still kind of just fail to focus if I don't have things breaking up my day a lot. Um, and fortunately, trading gives you that for free. You, If you do trading, then there are going to be a lot of distractions. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on. Um, so, and I think there are other like similar comments for the various cross comparisons you can do. Like, I think it's pretty common for someone to have the math skills to do all of these areas. I think it's relatively more rare for someone to have the other aspects of personal fit for all of these areas. Um, they might have enough personal fit for two or more areas. And then obviously you still have to make a decision, which will end up being a very personal decision in lots of cases. One thing I do want to say, because I just see, or I feel like I see this mistake being made over and over again, is I feel like sometimes people take a bit of a straw model of earning to give, where you make a lot of money and then you give half of it to say, uh, give well recommended charities. And then they contrast this with working in some area that they think is much higher impact than the donation target that they've just described. It might be AI safety. It might be politics. It might be working on global governance. Um, and then they're like, oh, well, isn't working on this area just clearly much more important? But the thing that's doing the work there isn't the working versus donating. It's the fact that you've decided that this area is much more important. Um, and in those cases, like money is flexible. If you think that there is something out there which is much more important than people in extreme poverty, then you can donate to that. If you think, as I do, that developing talent pipelines for a lot of these areas is very important, then you can donate to organizations like 80,000 Hours, which are developing those talent pipelines and so on and so forth. Like money is quite flexible. And I think sometimes people forget that. Mm. So if you think, yeah, changing policy is really important, then you can give to a think tank or give to a political campaign. Right. And ultimately, when you're giving money to a lot of these places, what you're doing is you're enabling other people to working on the problem by paying their salaries. Mm. And you should really think hard when you're making the choice between taking a job where you could pay six people to work on this problem or working on the problem yourself. It sounded like the reason you chose to go into quant trading was because you felt like it was a much better personal fit. It was kind of your comparative advantage because you didn't feel like you were such a good fit for academia or, or, or politics. 
That certainly, I think, was true for me. Like, especially with academia, which, you know, I had a lot of friends who went into academia. I went down a path doing pure maths at Cambridge, which does probably most naturally in some ways lead to doing a PhD. Um, and then I sort of diverted off it to do training. And, and the reason I did that was because as I got further and further into the degree and more and more of the work I was doing was more sort of research dissertation type work and less go and work through these problems type work, I just noticed I was enjoying it less and less. Um, and I was also doing worse and worse relative to my peers. Um, so it didn't make any sense to me personally to keep going down this path, which was already like flashing pretty clear signals that it probably wasn't a great fit for me. Um, and then as I was at the same time as I was coming to that conclusion, I did the internship at Jane Street and just noticed that I fit in really well there. So for me, this decision became quite easy. Right. So you thought acad academia wasn't such a good fit, but what other jobs did you consider taking personally? Um, personally, I, I considered doing Teach First. Um, this is um, very similar to Teach for America. Anyone listening from the US, so you go and work uh, as a teacher for some fixed period, two years is typical, and then you have the option to either continue in that path or do something else. It's like reasonably strong CV credentials. Um, I also considered going into the civil service via the fast stream route. Um, both of those were much more sort of generalist options. Um, they were options that I came up with when I wasn't sure what I wanted to do after university, but was constrained by the fact that I had to do something and I didn't think it should be academia. So I was trying to come up with things that would, in a way, sort of allow me to stall for time um, while I actually built up some experience of the working world and got a better idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and I think I could have done one of those options and been happy with it. And it just so happened that the summer before I graduated, I interned at the firm I currently work at and was very happy there. And that removed the need to sort of stall, if you like, on these options, which are good training, good CV credentials, good at helping you work out what you're good at, but less useful if you already know what you want to do. There's this issue of, you know, uh, your your comparative advantage or, or, the, or the comparative advantage of the person who's considering working in quant trading. But, but there's also this issue of um, whether they think that the problems that are most pressing in the world uh, can really be solved um, by, uh, by spending more money or having access to more money. So uh, to give the example of AI safety research, it seems like there's there's a lot of people out there who are willing to fund that research if there are qualified people to do it. So it might be an example of a, of a problem that, um, to, to use our terminology, it's it's talent constrained rather than than funding constrained. Uh, and so if, if you were particularly concerned about that, well, well, one, that's a reason perhaps not to donate to it because uh, well, if you think that it's saturated with funding, uh, but also it's potentially a reason not to earn to give if that's the area that you would want to be supporting the most. Do you agree with that? I think that is the strongest or close to the strongest version of the argument that I can come up with for um, for avoiding earning to give entirely. Because I think the, the argument you just made is obviously not specific to quant trading. It's like mm. a very general uh, argument about earning to give. Um, and But I, I have to like just be honest and say that you know, I'm just pretty skeptical in general of the concept of talent versus funding constraint. Um, okay. There's uh, there is a lot of ability to turn these things into each other with a delay, and sometimes that delay is really important. If you think, I think especially if you think that AI safety is not just a big problem but a really time critical problem such a time critical problem that we can't really wait for the next set of researchers to come online, then I think this argument gets stronger. Um, otherwise, I kind of want to sit down with this hypothetical individual and really understand why they think that going and working in AI safety themselves is better than spending money developing the talent pipeline. Because almost always there are things you can do to widen the talent pipeline. Um, obviously, if you personally are a particularly good personal fit for AI safety and not a great fit for trading, this question totally goes away. Um, and there are a lot of such people, and I obviously have no issue whatsoever with those people choosing to focus on AI safety. But I guess I try to think about this on that sort of movement level um, and thinking about it in terms of, you know, 
there are a bunch of people who are really bad fits for trading, like those people should be going and doing research. And there are a bunch of people who are really bad fits for research, those people should be going for doing trading. And if someone who's only a mediocre fit for research is still considering doing research because they feel like there's nothing that extra money can do, then I just encourage them to think hard about, actually, is there a way that money could enable more very high fit for research people to come into this field? So what sorts of things do you donate to and how do you, how do you decide where to give? I guess I have concentrated my donations in a few buckets over the years. Um, one of them is, uh, broadly speaking, like charities recommended by GiveWell. So these will be charities that uh, are in either global health or global poverty, and they're focused on people who are among the poorest people in the world and who are among the cheapest to help and who we have a good idea of what interventions we can do um, that will actually make a difference to those people. Um, that's one bucket. Um, and then I guess I have two other buckets. One of those is on focusing on the effect of altruism community itself. I think there are a lot of really good things about the community. I think I've benefited personally tremendously from being part of the community. And I do want to widen that. I want more people to receive those benefits. And I also want more people to be exposed to the kind of thinking that effective altruism offers. Um, and incidentally, I think that that kind of thing might help with the problem of there being not enough AI safety researchers. Um, and then, so that's another thing that I've given large amounts of money to. And then the third bucket is uh, in global poverty again, but focusing on more experimental things uh, that give well can't or won't recommend because they are too early stage or the evidence isn't quite there yet, but they're trying to get it there or something like that. So the main consideration for you in, in all of these cases is uh, the, the expected impact on people's well-being or are there other things as well? Um, I think for the latter two, that is by far the dominant consideration. For the first one, there are a few other harder to quantify considerations around things like, for instance, worrying about an effective altruism community where all the community does is fund itself, or at least all the major donors do is, is like sort of recycle the funding back into the community. And it sort of mm -hmm. becomes this like giant circular flow of money has like a faint whiff of a scam about it. I think we're pretty far away from that, but um, it's not something that I would want to inadvertently like Enable encourage. or encourage through my own donations. So that's definitely one part of like making sure that there's a distinct part of my bucket which helps people outside the community who I will never meet, who I have no personal interest in their welfare whatsoever, um, and actually like making a meaningful difference to those people's lives. Um, mm -hmm. There's also an aspect of a closely related aspect of what I feel most readily able to explain, defend, convince other people of. Um, you know, I, I'm generally, to someone who's never heard of effective altruism or has barely heard of effective altruism, I'm generally much happier talking about my donations to give well recommended charities than I am to my donations to effective altruist organizations. Not because I think the latter are bad, but I think they require more background context to really get a handle on and see why this might be a good use of money. Whereas there is something... Um, clearer and more straightforward in some ways about the give well recommendations. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess those are like sure. two other things that weigh more heavily, especially on that first bucket. You mentioned earlier that that you have some other colleagues who are donating a, a large fraction of their income, and, and maybe it's maybe it's becoming a larger number as as these ideas uh, get spread more widely. But presumably, most of your colleagues aren't aren't donating. Um, and it, has that ever discouraged you from donating yourself? Do you ever worry that you're going to lose interest in in doing good because most of your colleagues are focused on making money for themselves? I do. I do worry about it. I, I worry about it in a sort of abstract sense that you know. I'm worried about falling into the trap of thinking that, oh, what my colleagues are doing or in general, what my peers are doing, that, that couldn't ever possibly ever affect me. I am my own person. I make my own decisions, etc. I think there's something of a trap to that way of thinking, and I'm wary of falling into that trap. Um, on the other hand, uh, it hasn't really been, a, I don't think it's really been a problem so far. Like at this point, I have enough 
just about enough years under my belt that I can sort of look back and see, is this happening? Like, am I donating less over time or am I spending more over time? Um, and the answers to those questions are no and maybe, but not really enough that it's going to significantly impact my donations. Um, so I, why is that? I think this is where I'm really feeding the benefit of being part of the effective altruist community. Um, while I spend 50 hours a day at work, and that's one part of my life, um, I also am married, I also have a child, I also have a lot of friends in the effective altruist community, my wife is part of the effective altruist community. It would be actually pretty hard for me to leave the community and stop donating, even if I wanted to. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of, there are a lot of like really strong social incentives um, that are figuratively keeping me on the straight and narrow. Um, I don't want to for clarity, but, you know, as a practical matter, looking at myself with a slightly People more People tend cynical to copy eye. their friends and... Exactly, yeah. The firm you're working at uh, is, a, is a partnership, but a, a lot of quant traders work at hedge funds or, or investment banks. Um, well, what are the differences there? And, and do you think the, the culture might be difficult and, and more difficult to resist in other places? I'm wary to make two general comments about firms that I don't work at. Um, because the industry is big and uh, and it's varied. Um, I guess I can definitely say that I can think of places where it would be harder than it is for me. Um, I can think of places where I wouldn't be able or wouldn't feel able to be open with my colleagues about, about my donations and about my motivation for doing what I'm doing um, because it would be seen as weird or threatening and when people perceive you as weird and threatening then funnily enough you don't get as many responsibilities you don't get promoted as much you don't get paid as well and so on and so forth um so i'm very fortunate in that respect that it's just never been an issue for me um and i think the other thing that can come up is i mentioned that outside of work my time is my own um that's extremely helpful like some other uh, people will be working, either they'll be working such long hours that they don't really ha get to have a social life out of work, or they'll be working reasonable hours, but there's a subtle or sometimes not so subtle expectation of spending a lot of time with your colleagues outside of official working hours. So like socializing with people after work or whatever it is. Um, and I think when you have that kind of like total embeddedness in the culture, then it can become harder to like, keep to your original plan and your original motivations. Mm. Um, whereas for me, you know, while I'm working long hours by many people's standards, I'm also working easily short enough hours that I get to spend plenty of time with other people. Could, could you see yourself getting bored of the work or, or finding it unfulfilling because you're mostly helping people through your donations? I can't really see myself getting bored, to be honest. I think at the point at which I'm getting bored, I should look down my extremely long list of things I would like to do that I haven't had time to do. This is like things in my job that I would like to do that I haven't had time to do. And I should take the most valuable things off those lists and start doing those. Um, or possibly I should go to my manager and say, hey, I'm feeling a bit understretched right now. What are some things from your list of things you would like to do <laughs> that you haven't had time to do that you think maybe I mm. could take a look at? Like, my continuous feeling where I work is that there's so much stuff that could be done that would be worth money to the firm, would be of value to the firm, and there just aren't enough people to do it. And people respond to this by prioritizing, which is correct, and doing the things which are worth most first. Um, but it means it's very hard to get bored. Like When you say, I am bored in a place like that, what you're really saying is of the like thousands it must be across the firm of projects that people have that they would like to do that they haven't had time to do none of them is of interest to you which would be an unusual statement to make unless you've really changed quite significantly since you started work mm. and so you don't find it unfulfilling just doing good by uh, helping through donations um i think that definitely can be an issue for some people and actually it's probably something i should have mentioned earlier when we were talking about how can you tell whether you should do earning to give or do something else etc some people do just find that quite unsatisfying and i think those are very good candidates for people who shouldn't be doing earning to give um 
But for me personally, I don't really have a problem with it. What I'm doing at work is sufficiently close to the kinds of things I would be doing in my leisure time that I don't necessarily look for fulfillment there per se. I, I look for interest. I look for things that keep me engaged and my mind ticking. Um, and I look for feedback. I look for evidence of whether I'm doing things right or wrong. Um, but I'm pretty happy feeling uh, fulfilled in a sort of narrow sense at work whereby I feel fulfilled in that I know when I've done a good job and I feel satisfied when I do something and it works and it makes money. Like that is very satisfying and I gain a lot from that. And then the sort of wider, fuzzier sense of moral enlightenment, I'm happy to get from my donations. <laughs> Uh, so it doesn't sound like you're going to want to leave quant trading anytime soon. But but if you did, what, what kinds of uh, options would you have? Yeah, where do people go to? So a lot of the time, so some background to this is that a lot of these firms, including where I work, they invest a lot in recruitment. Uh, they invest a lot in training people. So they really don't want people to leave. That's like a loss of that investment, of that time and money spent. Um, so when people do leave, um, it's very rarely because the firm wants them to go. Um, it's normally because they're dissatisfied in some way. And so when people leave, they tend to go to things which will hopefully fix the thing that they're dissatisfied with, whatever it is. So when that happens, what do people do? So there have been cases I can think of where colleagues have left to return to academia. like They've decided they do actually prefer the research environment after all. Um, I can think of cases where obviously where people have left to go to other finance firms to do essentially similar things. Um, but sometimes they will be doing a job that's nominally similar, but maybe they're not as tied to market hours, um, which can be helpful if, say, you have a family and working those long hours doesn't really fit you anymore. Um, so, and then the other already big group worth mentioning is, is programming. like you will pick up a lot of just applied programming experience in the course of doing many of these jobs. And so if you do end up wanting to convert into doing a startup or even just working at a sort of big name tech company, that's quite likely to be something that you're able to do, maybe with a boot camp, maybe with some retraining, maybe not, maybe you'll just have developed those skills sufficiently already. Uh, are there people who leave who, I guess, retire young or go into nonprofits for, you know, to... to you know, do feel good for the, for the feel good factor about their work? Um, I can think of a couple of examples of that. Um, and I think I will be able to think of more just as the years go on and mm. my colleagues get older. Get the older. difficult thing with those people is that, it, it, you know, it's hard to identify them after the fact, right? Presumably there were some people at my firm who did that and left before I started, or maybe they left a bit after I started, but I didn't really know them yet. Um, so, it, so I don't really keep track of them. Yeah. Um, and my cohort, you know, all the people immediately around me, I haven't been there for long enough for people to be really doing that. But some people will definitely do that. They will at some point decide that they've made enough money and now they can either focus on nonprofit work or they can just take a job which they is more fulfilling or more laid back or whatever it is and not really worry about how much they're getting paid. So how is the industry doing as a whole? Do, do you worry about, you know, uh, stiff competition, reducing the amount of money you're making in the future? I guess, I mean, I, I worry about it. Like, I worry about it on a high level in the sense that I try and keep an eye on things that might make this a bad idea for me over the long run. But if the question is, do I think that this is a likely possibility or a sort of a meaningful reason to not go into the industry, then no, I don't worry about it in that sense. Um, and one of the ways I think about this is that like, the people running these firms, the people running my firm and running other firms in the industry, have a lot more information and a lot more vested interest in understanding that landscape than I do um, as a staff member. Like, It's much more relevant in some ways for the partners and the owners of the firms. Um, and they're hiring. They're hiring strongly in many cases, um, which is about as clear a signal as they're able to send that they still think that for the foreseeable future, they are going to need more people and more hands on deck rather than less. Um, at the point at which competition is eating into industry profits or is about to eat into industry profits so much that there'll be a sort of pulling back, I guess I don't expect to see the same level of like hiring focus as I see right now. Mm.
Well, uh, I guess you've probably got to get to, got to get to bed. Uh, thanks so much for your time. We've uh, been talking for for almost two hours, and we've covered a, a huge amount of stuff. Is is there anything you would like to tell people who at, you know, having listened to all of this, uh, are interested in, in in working in quant trading? Um, I don't think there's anything new I want to add. I think the thing that I mentioned, and I would just emphasize, is if you listen to all of this and you're like, maybe it's for me, maybe it's not. I'm not sure then I enc really encourage people to apply. It's like, it is hard for this to work out badly for you because it's such a low investment of your time if you get rejected. Well, awesome. Uh, hopefully um, we, can, we can talk again in a couple of years and see how, see how your career is going and how the industry has changed. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Cool, bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like to become a quant trader and think you have a good shot, go apply for coaching following the link on the blog post about the show. We have a bunch of other episodes uh, covering topics like artificial intelligence, uh, policy and research, pandemics, statistics, and more. You can subscribe and get those episodes by searching for 80,000 Hours wherever you get podcasts. And if you'd like to help us out, leave a review on iTunes or tell your friends about the show. Thanks so much.